thank you. Um, so today we'll talk about the pre-death grief and dementia caregiving. Um, I realize that this echo is, is kind of a, more of a geriatric focus, so we'll try to expand it a little bit, but a lot of the research on this concept has been around um, within the context of dementia, and so I'll explain this as we move forward. Um, a little bit about our team, very much like yours at UCI, we're an Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Um, we're the only one in Oregon um, and one of your team 31. Um, and like you, we do research um, in clinical care. So today I'd like to talk a bit about what, you know, what exactly is pre-death grief and discuss why it's important uh, discuss, and then discuss clinic-based strategies to, to help your team. Um, I think um, one of the videos I watched was with Dr. Terry Harvath, who is um, one of my colleagues and actually my mentor. And she had made a comment in her talk about, you know, how can we make the information we provide to you operational so it, it, you can do something with it. Um, so let's start from the top. Um, Dr. Harbath and I actually wrote this paper, the citations are in your PowerPoint, but basically we put our heads together to try to put, wrap our arms around what do we mean by grieving within the context of dementia care. And I'll go through this a little bit um, through the slides and discuss why it's fairly complicated. But in the process, we decided to, um, plan to flag and actually put out a definition um, because in our experience we had learned that um, the grieving experience of families living with dementia is different than other grief experiences so it's not really anticipatory grief um, it's not really chronic sorrow um, it's it has its own characteristics and the characteristics we thought of were um, it's uh, emotional response to perceived loss that occurs in and around a valued care partner. Um, families, like any grieving family, experience a variety of emotions. Um, and they not only wax and wane over time, but the emotions shift priorities, um, sometimes day to day, minute by minute. Um, it, this pre-death grief is due to a psych psychological, the, the care recipient's psychological death, which is asynchronous with their actual physical death. And that seems to be one of the very difficult pieces of it. I don't know if any of you have read um, any of uh, Pauline Boss's work on ambiguous loss, but it has that same kind of flavor. The sense of my family member is there, but they're not there. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit, and then we'll talk about this relationship between uh, pre-death grief, burden, depression, and maladaptive coping. So why is it, why is this important? There are a couple of reasons, but in my own practice, I see families, um, I see people with dementia and their family members in my clinic. And I think that the thing that where I reason where I find the most challenge is when the grief, the pre-death grief gets in the way of decision-making. And um, again, in your PowerPoint, in your reference section, you'll see Fowler's article in which they discuss how pre-death grief, those with higher levels of grief have more trouble with decision-making. So they, un they tend to underestimate their ability, they tend to experience more distress, and they tend to make decisions that are ineffective. So I'm not sure if any of you have been in this situation, but a good example is when um, I'm helping a family uh, fill out the provider's orders for life-sustaining treatment, the PULSE form, and the families um, are really committed to full care, okay. full treatment. Um, and, uh, and you think providing a more nuanced um, idea. Okay, okay. Um, so, for example, they want their family member with advanced dementia to receive CPR and feeding tube and so forth. And despite our explanations that um, that won't be su 
successful in, you know, a conversation around it. And, um, you know, I've seen people who are just really not really ready to entertain the fact that they could and maybe even should allow a natural death. And I think some of that is rooted in the, in the pre-death grief experience. Not all of it, but some of it. The other thing we know about family caregivers, um, actually family members, not specific to caregivers, who experience more pre-death grief have worse grief post-death, so complicated grief. Um, the, you know, difficulty with resolution. Um, I um, am actually working with a, a gentleman right now who is absolutely destroyed by his wife's death. Um, and when I was actually also taking care of his wife and um, during the caregiver period, he was extremely burdened and extremely stressed. And, you know, I don't even think he had the ability to recognize his grief. And now he, you know, he's lost 40 pounds. He's um, you know, people uh, hire. Uh, antipsychotics and that we're really struggling, working really hard with psychiatry to pull him out of this, but it's tough. Um, and I, I'm sure you've seen this too. I know, and not not shockingly, um, pre-death grief is associated with more burden. And we also know that people who experience pre-death grief, um, there seems to be some overlap with depression. It's they, what Holly and Mass, the authors in the in the PowerPoint, have shown us is that they are distinct entities. I think many of us have been in a situation where we're actively grieving, but we're not depressed. Um, but they, there is a lot of overlap, right? They kind of feed on each other. So for all of those reasons, and I'm sure many more that you could think of, it's important to consider, is this family member that I'm working with grieving? So the first part, of course, is this perceived loss. Um, so this idea that I'm losing my husband, my mother, and that that person, that husband or mother is valuable to me. Um, I, I do re research in which we test an intervention um, to help families deal with some of the challenging behaviors. And pre-death grief seems to come out a lot because the conversations are one-to-one -one without the, the person with dementia in the room. And I, I distinctly remember one wife, um, just weeping and saying, I just miss him so damn bad. And I think that just teaches really got to the heart of what, what we're talking about here. And yeah, she, she had a real hard time. So what are they losing? Well, a lot. I mean, and, and believe me, I'm not trying to be negative here. I know there are wonderful sides of, of um, dementia. I've seen it myself. Um, but for the sake of explanation, there are losses and we can't discount that. The person with dementia is losing their personhood. And, you know, Kit would, would talk about, you know, a valuable person within the disease process. There's loss of social status. There's loss of companionship, social roles, and relationships. And I think that for many spouses, that loss of social role and relationship is, is really important. For adult um, children, the loss of relationship can be really confusing. I know many of you have met families who say something like, I'm her daughter, but I'm acting like her mother. And that that loss of a mother, even before the mother has passed on or died, is, is tricky. Um, in the literature, you'll see um, some of the qualitative literature, caregivers say things like, she's just a shell of herself, or she's, um, again, she's there, but she's not there. And then I also think it's really interesting, this statistic from the, um, uh, the, uh, sorry, I'm blanking on the term. It's the National Caregiver uh, Alliance did a uh, survey and they found that many people who actually live with their care recipient actually feel alone. And I bet you that number is higher. Um, but I also am worried about this. And that is that many um, people that care for 
uh, person with dementia, and I'm sure many people, not just specific to dementia, experience some type of verbal, physical, or sexual abuse by the parent, spouse, for whom they are caregiving. In Kong's study, they found um, almost 20% of their caregivers experienced this childhood mistreatment. Um, again, I have a hunch that the numbers are much higher. So for that reason, I'm extremely careful to avoid the term loved one. You'll see this oftentimes um, um, on many like advocacy websites or in papers or in manuscripts, they talk about the person with dementia as the loved one. And I know you have, and I have too, not everybody loves the person they care for. About 60% of caregivers, mostly women, um, did not choose to be caregivers. They just, the family assumed they would, or there's nobody else. So not only do they, do they have this possible sense of entrapment, they also, may not really love this person, or they may love them, but it's a really complicated feeling. So um, I would beg you to avoid the word loved one. Um, we don't wanna pile guilt on these families. Um, if they're already providing the care, terrific. They can tell us about how they feel, but I usually just say things like your mother, your father, your spouse, your family member with dementia. And to that point, many care, oh, every caregiver, I'm sure, who deals with a family member with dementia experiences a variety of emotions. And, you know, in, um, in Kubler-Ross's stages of grief, you know, there's this idea that we kind of move in somewhat of a pattern from denial to acceptance. Um, and it's not perfect, right? You can go back and forth between one stage and up and back. But I think for families living with dementia, it's it's much more of a roller coaster ride. Um, the denial and the anger can switch over in an instant to depression or acceptance or even joy. Um, one of the phenomena I notice in my work is that a person with dementia will sometimes have lucid moments. Um, and, and that can just be really uh, confusing for caregivers. And by lucid, I mean, not just lucid, I mean, kind of back to their own, own selves. So in one qualitative paper, one of the caregivers talked about, you know, she said she came alive again. She was herself again. It was amazing. And so, and so the caregivers are like, yeah, I saw my mom again. And if I, if I knew what it was that made that happen, I would do it all the time, but they don't know what it is. And so it's, it's just very confusing. And so for that reason, I think that, you know, the sorrow, the anger, the yearning just wax and wane over the course of a dementing disease. Um, one paper found that people start to experience pre-death grief with the diagnosis. And some people, um, you know, it doesn't really present itself again until later in the disease process. For others, it's kind of chronically throughout the disease process. Um, we know that there are certain things that contribute to pre-death grief. Obviously, the sense that the person is, 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 you're losing them psychologically, but physically, they can't actually be quite healthy. And then the very, very long disease trajectory, um, especially with Alzheimer's disease. Um, of course, with other disease processes like frontotemporal dementia, that disease process can be fairly short, maybe five years. Um, but for somebody with Alzheimer's disease, it can be five years, 10 years, 15 years. Um, I'm working with a family now who um, the, uh, the wife had, uh, you know, three years ago had lost a substantial amount of weight, could no longer feed herself, thought the only thing that she could do was walk. Um, and so she would pace the house most of the day. And so we had a hospice evaluation and lo and behold, she wasn't eligible. Um, but I thought, you know, another six months or so she'll be eligible. So now um, three years later, um, she's finally eligible. And I think, you know, I've learned to be very careful about prognostication because I, I, I just can't seem to get it right. It's very tricky. But again, the disease process can be really long and you never know, like, when is it going to end? And I'll talk about that in a minute. 
Um, communication is often compromised between the person with dementia and the family caregiver. It's nobody's fault. It's just that, you know, for um, some dementias in particular, it's, um, such as primary progressive aphasia, the, um, they lose the ability to communicate fairly quickly. And then of course, changes in roles and relationships. So now I'd like to take a couple minutes to talk about things you can do as a clinician to smooth the path for these caregivers. So the first is measure and inform. Um, this is a, a measure that I like, the Marwit Muser Caregiver Grief Index. And it, um, it measures three parts of, of grief, the burden, uh, heartfelt sadness and longing, and worry and that feeling of being really isolated. You could give this to your family members while they're in the waiting room or while they're waiting in, in the room for you and they can just go through and, and uh, mark how they're feeling and then you can score them and see where they are. Um, what uh, Tom Muser has told us is that if the score is very low, it's either that the family is doing exceptionally well, or perhaps they're in a state of denial. And of course, the higher they get, the more concerned one should be. Um, this is the reference for this paper. The authors actually put the whole thing in the paper so you can just use it. And um, there's actually been a fair amount of research on this measure, both um, its validity and also uh, testing it in several different languages. So. Um, I, I think it really gets to the heart of what we're talking about. And then once you have the score, I think it's helpful to inform caregivers what's going on. What I've noticed in my work is actually just doing the assessment kind of um, increases their awareness of what's going on with them. Many caregivers don't know that they're grieving. They don't understand that they're grieving. And when we actually name it for them, it has, it has great validity for them that it really is very meaningful. Like, oh yeah, that's, that's exactly what we're talking about. So it's, it's validating, I think. Of course, you have to be careful, right? Um, because if you're in a busy clinic and you've got you know, four people waiting, it'll be tricky to deal with somebody who just really finally realizes they're actively grieving. And so that's when you know, your social work team, your MA team can be invaluable in helping you manage um, and of course, if it doesn't work that day, do it another day. Um, of course, for families, I do tend to acknowledge that they are grieving. The other phenomenon I've noticed is um, the desire for death. And families really tiptoe very carefully into this because they don't want to be judged. But they do want to, they do say things like, he would never want to be like this. Can you just stop the denepazil and the memantine and let's just kind of get this show on the road here. And um, I think that's, it's a fair comment. I mean, many, you know, most people are terrified of having dementia and most caregivers are right. Uh, you know, my husband wouldn't want to be that way. And so just acknowledging that that's a normal feeling um, and that's okay. Of, of course, you know, if, if you're worried about homicide or suicide, that's a different issue. But just being able to talk about the fact that it's okay to want the death. Um, also, um, and, you know, acknowledge that, and you might want to prepare them a little bit that when the person does die, they may have a sense of relief. And that relief is okay and normal, and they shouldn't feel guilty about it. And they will feel grief too. It can be very confusing. Um, what the literature tells us about helping people with pre with pre death grief is to try to encourage relationships with friends, families, neighbors. Um, they noted that social support is important, um, but it's even more effective when it comes from people who are really close to us already. A support group is a very good idea, of course, um, but there seems to be something about going through the process with family that's really important. I've seen, and I know you have two um, families that come into me that with dementia, and they'll say things like, you know, our friends have vanished. Um, I don't, you know, I don't, they haven't called, they haven't done anything. 
Um, they'll also say things like, my kids are too busy to help. I don't want to bother them. Um, and this is really important um, to, to engage them. I think was it, was it um, the Pittsburgh team? They had actually a billboard. Um, uh, Josh, you probably remember this. They had a billboard campaign, which was around the city that said something along the lines of, now is the time to ask your kids for help or to the kids, now is the time to step into your parents' lives. Because what we know is that when families become engaged, it offers them an opportunity to develop and discover more meaning within, within themselves. For the daughter who's super, super busy and has two kids and can't make time for dad, um, she may find that making a lasagna once a month gives her a sense of engaging with, the, with her dad in a way that she hadn't before. And she may want to do more. So by what I tell the families I work with is when you say your kids are too busy and you don't engage them, you're depriving them of an opportunity to deepen their life experience. And you know, even if they don't, oh well, you know, it should be, it should be shared. The other thing I tell families is um, make a list and keep it in your purse or your wallet or whatever of things that fam friends and family can do to help you out, to support you. Um, so this is something I hear a lot. Um, well, you know, just let me know if there's anything I can do. And that's when you pull out your list and you say, yeah, actually there is something you can do. Um, just pick one. You don't have to call me. I'll just show up and walk the dog. That'd be great and you know, tell them to give the list to other friends. That just removes you, I don't know, for those of you who are parents, this whole idea of taking, taking you out of the equation and just you know, let them figure out how they're gonna help you. But it also gives them, you know, oh great, I can go sit with Ted for an hour, that's easy. So that's what I recommend. And that, again, the whole idea here is building up their back, their social support, so that grief experience that they're feeling we hope we can modify it just a smidge. Um, the other thing that, the other phenomena that I've noticed, another way grief has um, presented itself, if you will, in my practice are um, when out of town family come into town and see um, the state of a parent, a brother, a, a, a spouse. Um, as we know, at, you know, most, the most common dementia, obviously, is Alzheimer's disease. And that's a very slow and gradual process, right? Um, I think of Alzheimer's disease as a ball rolling down a very subtle hill. So the disease progression is subtle and you, you kind of hardly really notice it if you're living with a person day to day. But then sister, comes into town, brother comes into town and they're like, oh my God, she can't even operate the stove anymore. And then they're shocked, they're angered. They insist on, on taking the family member to see you and make this right um, or insist that they move mom into memory care just as soon as you can. And so for those families, I really do think that their reactions are rooted in the grief experience. And just what I try to do is let them have as much control as possible. So for example, I'm working with a family right now where um, the, the uh, uh, parent has Lewy body disease and the um, daughter who lives um, in the Midwest or in Oregon comes out and is just appalled at the situation. And so the caregiver that I work with, of course, is very distressed. Um, so the out of town daughter wants to come in, move mom, she's not doing well in her facility. She's falling, she's not engaged. She wants to move her mom to a different facility. And so what I did was um, tell the, the in town caregiver, let her come into town, let her do the research, have her meet with a housing specialist and just let her gather that information herself so she feels like she has a sense of control. And you know, recognize that, yeah, maybe a different facility would work, but what's important is to give them a little bit of control so they feel like they're engaged and involved in a way that's, um, that's meaningful to them. You have to be kind of careful. It's, a, it's an art, isn't it, um, doing that? 
And on that note, I do try to make very sure that the families I do work with have a power, power of attorney form. Um, because in this situation, we were able to say, yeah, go ahead, look around. But you know what? I'm the power of attorney. I'm the final decision maker. So you can, oh, I'm sorry. My husband let the dog in. Um, uh, so that the daughter who's the decision maker, that's her legal right. And the daughter from out of town can do whatever she wants, but when it comes down to it, the power of attorneys with the daughter in town. The other recommendation, um, and again, the references are in your PowerPoint um, for helping families deal with grief is to help them by having them learn about dementia. Now, as busy clinicians, it's not your job to sit down and teach them, but do make sure they're hooked up with um, one of the uh, uh, advocacy groups that can help with this. So of course, the Alzheimer's Association, the Lewy Body Dementia Association, the Association for Frontotemporal Dementia, or excuse me, Generation. I have found that when I work with Lewy Body families and they go to an Alzheimer's Association support group, they don't feel like it quite fits. So I try to, you know, when you do have a pretty good sense of what the diagnosis is, if you could funnel them to the right place, it can be really helpful. Um, for families living with frontotemporal degenerative diseases, such as primary progressive aphasia, behavioral variant of TD, progressive supranuclear palsy, definitely get them to the AFTD. And the AFTD actually has what they call a Comstock grant. Uh, I didn't put it on here, but it's C-O-M-S-T-O-C-K and that they can get a $500 grant um, that can be towards respite care. So it could be bringing somebody in, it could be for a yoga class. They'll even um, fund a computer and internet access so a family member can hook up with a social support group. Um, Savvy Caregiver is a very common program developed by Ken Hepburn at Emory University. This program, um, uh, allows caregivers to really become masters of their work, but it also informs them about dementia. And then of course, YouTube, we have all gone there. Um, I like Tipa Snow's work. Um, she talks about how we are all gems and to help families look for the gem within the progressive disease. So those are just some resources for you. Um, also know, and, and I'm sure because, you know, this obviously is, is housed at UCI, um, there's a lot of caregiving research going on right now. A lot of it's online, and it's pretty, a pretty exciting time to be doing this work. Um, this one is available to you. This is um, Laura Gitlin at Drexel University. Many of you may know her. She's a talented occupational therapist and um, She's um, doing some really good work. Again, this is online. Um, uh, Elizabeth Dillsboro at Emory is doing this project that is for um, an adolescent whose parents have an uh, early stage onset dementia. Not so much an educational class, but I'm of the belief that anytime you talk about your experience, it's gonna be educational. And then this is our work where we have developed an intervention to help families deal specifically with some of the distressing behaviors that come with um, dementia. And, and that can be a two-way street, right? It can be the person with dementia who may be exhibiting some type of distressing behavior, such as pacing, yelling, hitting, biting, but it, that person also lives with somebody else. And so we also talk about the family caregiver and how their behaviors affect the person with dementia as well. We all have behaviors and we have to address them all. So those are just some ideas. There's some really great research out there. Do tap into it. Um, the science also encourages us to promote communication. I'm not sure if you recall, but earlier we talked about one of the factors that contributes to pre-death grief is the breakdown of communication. Um, I try to refer my patients to a, a neuro speech and language pathologist just as soon as I can. Um, the, uh, these are cognitive rehab specialists. And so they focus specifically on helping um, my family members with dementia learn how to do things. So learn um, how to keep up, you know, use their phones to facilitate memory but they also talk about how to communicate with each other. 
so one of the things they'll tell the families um, living with primary progressive aphasia is that your person may not be able to talk fluently to you, but they can often read and understand what you have written. And so it just opens up a whole new avenue of communication that they may not have been aware of. Um, our speech and language team recommends that they see them every six months um, just to kind of follow them over time, make sure they're getting what they need. And again, to be clear, these are not the specialists that um, uh, specialize in swallowing and eating. These are the speech and language pathologists that specialize in cognition and communication. Um, I also refer people to physical therapy and occupational therapy. Um, many times families will kind of roll their eyes at me and say, well, they're not gonna follow any of the instructions, but a good physical therapist or an occupational therapist will include the family and help them feel a sense of engagement and, um, and mastery, I think it's the word I'm looking for. And then I always make sure that if the family has any questions about legal issues or they don't have their power of attorney, make sure we get that and refer to legal services if needed. Um, I know you all do this, so I apologize for the redundancy, but um, do um, refer to hospice just as soon as you can. Again, if, if they're not eligible, at least perhaps they can at least meet the hospice agency staff. Um, in my world, it seems to be that things kind of tick along for a long period of time and then suddenly they need hospice like tomorrow. And so if they already have that relationship with hospice, it makes that transition much easier. And the nice thing about hospice, of course, is that they will check in on the person, the, the family caregiver six months after death. So try to inter, um, intervene uh, in that grief process after death. Okay, so in summary, I hope that you know we've um, helped you understand the grief if you haven't already and recognize that it's a normal piece of caregiving, but also as a, a part of caregiving that can be quite taxing. And hopefully through um, promoting engagement and communication, families can navigate this uh, path um, with a little bit more grace and compassion. Um, so thank you so much for your time. This is my email. Um, feel free to email me if you have questions or thoughts or comments.